You know, I know uh, God wants to say something today. And I'm probably going to cry. I'm just going to tell you right now. I'm going to cry. Every time I prayed about this, I could not hold back the tears. But that's okay, because God engages every part of us, and part of that is our emotions too. So I just pray that whatever God wants to speak today is going to minister to all of our hearts. So can we just, let's open, before we even get to a text, let's just open in prayer and ask that God would keep our hearts wide open today. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your spirit that we've already felt here in this house. Thank you for the congregation of believers here, the brothers and sisters that gather together and worship your name and magnify you and lift you up. God, we're so thankful that we have a place we can come to to worship together in spirit and in truth. God, I ask that you would just keep our hearts wide open. Lord, get rid of every distraction, anything that would want to hinder your word going forth because we know that it's up to us to respond to the word and today the word is going to be preached and it's already anointed because it came from your mouth so lord i pray that you would give us the strength to keep our hearts open and help us to be aware enough in mind and in body to receive your word today god and let it be an encouragement to our soul let it encourage and strengthen our bones today we give you glory and honor and you sit on the throne in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read an opening text real quick, and then we can have a seat. The title today is Court is in Session. Revelation chapter 12. I already feel it, this scripture. Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. I'm going to read these in the Amplified Version, okay? And the great dragon was thrown down, the age-old serpent who was called the devil and Satan, he who continually deceives and seduces the entire inhabited world. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom that is the dominion and reign of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our believing brothers and sisters has been thrown down at last. He who accuses them and keeps bringing charges of sinful behavior against them before our God day and night. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to unpack this together, but you can all be seated. We're going to get to the really exciting verse in just a little bit, but I... I just felt like we need to level set and really understand what is happening here in, in verses 9 and 10. Um, how many of you have ever been to court? No, I'm just kidding. Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> just a joke. Um, <laughs> we don't need to know. But there is jury duty. Okay. I got picked for jury duty one time, and I never got selected to be on a jury. I just sat in that room for like eight hours until they told me I could go home. <laughs> But court, um, you know, when you read the Bible, there is a lot of legal terms and something like you can read through a lot of um, even legal proceedings through Scripture. Because how many of you know that God is a judge? He is the judge, right? Scripture says that over and over. And he passes judgment and he listens to everything that goes on in our life and Ultimately, when we get to the very end, there's something that's called the great white throne judgment. We'll read that scripture towards the end of, of this today. But, but there is this whole court proceeding, and in my mind, as I was praying for this, it's almost like it plays out all through our life until the very end is where the verdict is passed. But first, what we see before we even get to that part, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 and 10 we see a battle happen in verse 9, uh, actually before that in chapter 12. But verse 9 is where the enemy is defeated. He is cast down out of heaven and to earth. And then you see uh, a cry of victory that happens. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. That's a, that's a declaration of victory over the enemy. We see the authority of God established and finally we see what the enemy does, he accuses. That's the description that's given to 
the one that we call the, the enemy, his name is Lucifer, but we hardly ever call him Lucifer. We usually call him the devil, the enemy, Satan. We use those words. But they're, those aren't actually names for him. His name is Lucifer, and devil and Satan are titles because they describe what he does and what he is. So in Revelation chapter 12, we see both terms used for the enemy. He's called, uh, well, we see three actually. He's called a serpent or the great dragon, which uh, he, he's also called the devil, and he's also called Satan, all in this, these two scriptures. So the, the terms or these titles, devil and Satan, does anybody know what they mean? Because this gives us a glimpse into the kind of being that Lucifer is. The evil one, kind of. Deceiver, yeah. Go ahead, Sister Calhoun. Yeah. The accuser, the slanderer. Devil is a Greek word, diablos, which means the slanderer. Capital S when it's used in a capital, when it's used as a proper noun. The slanderer. That is what Lucifer is, the slanderer. And then all th in the Old Testament and New Testament, you see this other title show up, Satan. And Satan is a Hebrew word, Satan, which means the adversary or the accuser. So understanding what those title means, or understanding those titles helps you to understand what to look out for when the enemy comes after you. Because he is a slanderer and he is an accuser. He's an adversary of the Most High. And the Bible describes him in Revelation as the accuser of the brethren. That's King James, the accuser of the brethren or the accuser of the brothers and sisters. Let me tell you this. The enemy attacks the people of God and brings accusations against the people of God because he don't have to worry about the people living in sin. That's why he's called the accuser of the brethren, because he is always trying to bring accusations to say, you're not good enough. You messed up too bad. God don't love you no more. His blood can't cover your sins. That's what he does. He is the accuser, and he tries to slander the people of God. That's the enemy that we face. He can't... Uh, kill our bodies. He can't attack us physically, so he attacks us with words. He creeps in the middle of the night and whispers in our ear, you're not good enough. And we see this happen. There's a bunch of examples, in the, in, specifically in the Old Testament that we'll talk about, where we see Lucifer play this out in the way that he interacts with, with humanity. In Revelation 12, 9, he's called a dragon or a serpent. And when's the last time or the, I should say the first time that you hear the devil described that way. It's in the Garden of Eden. He approaches Eve as a serpent. And the Bible says that as he approached Eve, and, and it starts to talk about what the serpent is, that it's more subtle than the other beasts of the field. Y'all seen that word before, right, in the King James? More subtle. That's a Hebrew word that means crafty or uh, wise with words, actually. And that the enemy, like what Sister Calhoun said in Spirit Life today, he can't give you the true product of what God wants to give you. So what he does is he takes things, twists it, and gives you a counterfeit or tries to offer that counterfeit to you in place of what God wants you to have. So what we see in the Garden of Eden is God tells Adam and Eve, you can have everything you want here. Just don't touch this one tree. Right, So God shows them all the blessing, all the things they can have, all the freedom that they have and the liberty in the Garden of Eden. And what does the enemy do? He didn't lie, but he's, he flipped the subject of what God was saying. God said, you can have everything, just don't touch this one tree. And the enemy came in and said, you can't have everything because you can't have that one tree. You're missing something. Right, So he's wise with his words, the way that he twists things and tries to get us to believe things because if the enemy can sow doubt into the heart of a believer, that's exactly what he wants to do because he can get a saint right where he wants them to be if we start to doubt. So we see the enemy being subtle and, and using his words to try to manipulate humanity because he can't destroy God. He can't destroy, uh, he can't really wage a war against God. That's a losing war all the time. So what does he do? He attacks the image of God. And who's the image of God? Humanity. We were created in God's image. So the enemy slanders, accuses, and tries to deceive the image of God because he can't beat God. 
So we also see this office or these titles in Job chapter, chapters 1 and 2, when the enemy, uh, actually that's a really interesting, uh, ex- like an interesting thing to study there because the Bible says in Job chapter 1 verse 1 that there was a particular day where all of the angels came to present themselves before God. And then the slanderer, the devil, he shows up too. And God asks him, what are you doing here? Because he didn't belong there. What are you doing here? And the devil tries to slander Job in front of God. He says, God, Job isn't what you think he is. If, if you didn't protect him, if you would let him experience some hardship in life, he would turn his back on you. That's slander, trying to smear the character of Job in front of God. And Job chapter, 1 verses, uh, Job chapter 1 verse 11, this is exactly what the devil said in the Amplified. But put forth your hand now and touch or destroy all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. That's what the enemy accused Job of, that he would turn his back on God if God allowed him to experience some hardship in life. But what was God's response? God had faith in Job, or he trusted Job. He knew the condition of Job's heart, Because God doesn't look at the outside like we do. We know that through the selection of King David. God looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. So God knew that Job would be able to endure this. So so he actually put Satan to the test and said, okay, I will show you what kind of man Job is. And he allowed Job to go through some hardship. And what happened? Job never turned his back on God. But the enemy still tried to smear the character of Job in front of God. Still tried to slander and to accuse Job a believer in front of God. So the devil, uh, that word can also be used, uh, this might be a familiar word since we're talking about court today, but the, the title devil can also be translated as prosecutor. So when we look at the, when we look at the, the example of the word picture today, the devil is like the prosecuting attorney in the courtroom of heaven. At least that's what we see in scripture, that he's an accuser of the brethren, that he could be looked at as a prosecutor, one who brings charges against a saint, somebody who accuses of wrongdoing. And God is the judge. And this was like the, just bear with me as I play through this picture that kept coming into my mind while I was praying about this. But in that courtroom, it's almost like our whole life is going through a court proceeding in heaven or a court procedure. Like we already talked about, when we get to the end, that's when the verdict is given. But throughout our life, uh, uh, you know, the way we live is all of these records are being kept by God. He, he keeps records and, and the enemy likes to use those bad things or the sin or the, the places where the saints fall to bring accusations in that courtroom to try to remind God or to show God, kind of like he did with Job. See, they're not what you think they are. They sinned. They did this. They don't deserve their love. And then all the while, while the enemy is slandering in front of the presence of God, he's also slandering us to our face as saints saying, you're not good enough. You messed up too much and God's blood can't cover you. That's the enemy that we deal with every day. So court is in session today. And the picture that I had is like, I'll just use myself because I was picturing myself in this. That I'm sitting there in the, you know, wherever the, what do they call the people who are being defended? The plaintiffs? Okay. Sitting at that, that table and listening to this, all of the accusations, the enemy using his wise words and the way he speaks and weaving this story about how terrible this saint is and how horrible they are and they committed adultery and they got into drugs and they did this, they did that. And all of spinning this story and and reminding of sins and places where the saints failed uh, and, and through this court and just sitting there feeling like so small and God behind his judge's station or whatever it is sitting on that big chair observing and watching. All right, I'm going to go somewhere, I promise. But 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5, we know 
that God is a judge. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And then Psalm 50, verse 6, let the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. So he's there judging everything. God sits on the throne and he is the only righteous judge. He created everything. And think about this. God is the one who put all moral laws in place. They're not our laws. They're God's morality put in, into time and space. There's a reason why even people who don't live for God have a moral compass to some degree. Now, that compass can get corrupted and degrade over time depending on how an individual lives, but everyone has this moral compass. There's something, kids know what right and wrong is, and it's our, our job, you know, as saints to guide them in, the, in God's morality, but but there's, God is the one who set these moral laws. And unfortunately, every human on the face of the planet has broken those laws at some point in their life. You know, there was a really horrible account of Auschwitz that I was sharing with Brother Rob the other day. Um, I'm actually reading a book on Christian apologetics, and he was talking about uh, this encounter he had with a Holocaust survivor. This the book was written a long time ago. So, but the, the 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 survivor was a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, and what he was saying is how degraded humanity can get and how backwards humans can get. And he said the best way that he could describe Auschwitz was that all 10 commandments were reversed. Instead of love your neighbor, hate your neighbor. Instead of don't bear false witness against your neighbor, lie on them. And it was like all of this was twisted. And it just shows how humans, we tilt towards that darkness. We tilt towards the things of the flesh. And, you know, the enemy brings that up to us a lot of times. Like you remember back then when you did this and when you did that. Romans chapter 3 verse 20, 23 says, since all have sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God. We, we cannot measure up to these moral laws that God put into place. And when the enemy likes to bring his accusations, he goes through that whole list of Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and all the works of the flesh and all the bad things that you did and all the things that you said and all the bad things you thought and the person you used to be. Because that's all the enemy can really do is bring up those past things. Because we'll get somewhere, but the enemy really likes to try to grave rob into our past the things that are dead and no longer alive. The enemy likes to use those to say, you're not worthy because you did X. Well, the truth is, we're not worthy anyways. But man, that voice, and I know we can all identify with this. When it's the dead of night and you're having trouble sleeping, and those thoughts creep in, saying, you're not good enough. We've all been there. That's that prosecuting attorney. That's the enemy trying to bring charges against the saints. And all the while, when we hear these accusations, we just feel smaller and smaller. And, and if we're not careful, it starts to whittle away at that spiritual strength until we just feel haunted by our past. And when we give in to the words of the enemy, shame and guilt come and wash over us and just make us feel like we're not worth anything. And really, we're not. God gives us value, but... But it's like the enemy likes to drive that knife of condemnation so deep into our souls that we can't even, or don't feel like we can even cry out to God anymore. That we don't even have the ability to do that. That's what the enemy, that's the place he wants to get every saint to. Because if he can paralyze the church, then he's, he's going to destroy the image of God. Now we know that's not the case, and we know that, that he will not win. We can read that in the book that Satan is not going to win. He never will. But man, when you're in the middle of it, it still don't feel good. That's the voice of the accuser. The voice of God might bring correction and conviction at times, but the voice of the accuser will always bring shame and guilt and condemnation. That's a real easy test to know which voice you're listening to. The voice that I'm listening to, is that building me up as a child of God? Is it 
uh, driving me to be obedient to the word of God? Or is it telling me how little I am and how unable I am and how horrible as a person I am? That's a great way to tell which voice you're listening to. But one day, we will get to the verdict. The court's in session right now, but the verdict is coming. And the enemy, you know, given his closing arguments when we're at the end of our life and, you know, God's sitting on his throne in all his justice. This is just what I imagine. This isn't in the Bible, okay? But this is just my thoughts, right? We're standing there before God in the courtroom. The verdict is about to be passed. Lucifer gets done, you know, sharing all the bad things that this person has done in their life and how they deserve hell and they deserve to be separated from God for all of eternity because they're not a good person and so on and so forth. And God sits back in his chair and he looks at Lucifer and this is just in my mind, okay? He might say something like, you got a little bit of a point, Lucifer. All humans are sinful. This person sinned all their life and I have their record right here. And so God goes to the record book after he listens to Satan, listens to all the, the accusations and the slander and everything, and he opens his book. And God says, I have their record, and this is what I see. It's covered in the blood. And God stands up and answers the accuser on our behalf because we can't answer those accusations. We have no right to say anything because we know we've messed up and we know we've lived in sin in our past and whatever. So God stands up from, behind, from his chair in the courtroom of heaven and he says, I died and rose again for that saint. I have redeemed them and covered them in my blood. Their record is right here and I don't see any sin. I don't see any record of wrongdoing. All I see see is my blood on this page and revelation 12 and 11 says and they overcame and conquered him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony for they did not love their life and renounce their faith even when faced with death this is the answer to the accuser it is the blood of the lamb because there is nothing we can do to earn our way into heaven. And the enemy knows that. So God steps in on our behalf. The Bible says that he is the mediator, Jesus Christ, between God and man. Because he paid the price. He covered the record in blood. So when we get to the end of our life and we're standing before God in judgment, he will pull out the record book. And this is what he'll see. Because God is not just our judge, but he is the best defense attorney we could ever have. Both of those answers, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony come from God. We cannot answer for the sins, for our own sins. The blood came from the perfect lamb of God. Matthew chapter 14, verse 24, and he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 uh, says, For you know that you were not redeemed from your useless, spiritual, unproductive way of life, inherited by the tradition from your forefathers with perishable things like silver and gold, but you were actually purchased with the precious blood, like that of a sacrificial lamb, unblemished and spotless, the priceless blood of Christ. The priceless blood of Christ. Silver and gold, you don't have enough in the world to have enough value as the blood of Christ. Because I'll tell you this, the sin debt that we have all inherited, not one of us can pay. It takes an eternity of separation from God to atone for that sin. So we had to have somebody pay it for us. And that's what Jesus came to this earth to do. To redeem and to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. So the blood, that perfect blood that was shed on Calvary covers any sin. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what your record looked like. 
When the blood is applied, this is all that's seen. This is it. You can't even see any writing through this blood. But what the enemy really likes to do is to try to remind us of the things that we did before this happened in our life. He likes to go to the past and to try and get us to believe that we are the person before the blood was applied. And those are the only accusations that he can bring. And what we have to do, as Revelation says, truly remind ourselves of the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Because if we're not careful and we start to listen to the enemy, we start to believe what he's saying. If we're not careful, we have to bolster our faith by reminding ourselves, I am a child of God. God purchased me with his blood. He paid the ultimate sacrifice so that I could have a relationship with him. This isn't just, we have to remind ourselves this over and over again. We have to speak our testimony because when we speak our testimony, it glorifies God and it reminds us of where we came from and the different creature that we are today. The testimony that we carry came from the transforming power of our creator. John chapter three, verses six and Six and seven in the Amplified say, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. The physical is merely physical, in other words. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be surprised that I have told, the, or that I have told you. You must be born again. To be transformed, you must be born again. Sister Calhoun hit this when we were talking about holiness this morning. It doesn't matter what you inherited from your natural birth. You must be born again. And through that second birth, we are transformed and born into something spiritual. We're transformed into something new. New life has sprung up where death happened. And the Amplified just adds in, reborn from above, that's spiritually transformed, renewed, and sanctified. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. This one's in the New King James, so I won't have all that extra. But it says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That God does something in our life. He changes us. He makes us new. It's not immediate, but throughout our life, the hands of God are working on us. All the while, even when we're sitting in that courtroom and the enemy is trying to bring accusations, God's hand is still at work in our life. Even when the enemy is trying to speak to the saints and tell us, you're not good enough, you don't deserve that, or whatever he says, all the while, if we just look to what God is doing and forget about rebuke, ignore the enemy, we can start to see the blood in our life. We get to start to see the transforming power that happens. Romans chapter 12 challenges us, don't be like the world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind, allow the word of God to transform us, to make us something new. So that when we do get to the end of our life and the verdict is passed, that verdict is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. All I see is your name written in the Lamb's book of life and the blood of Jesus applied to your record. That's the verdict that I want to see at the end of my life. So when the voice of the accuser speaks, remind him that we have the blood on our life. And go ahead and just speak your testimony. You go ahead. When the enemy starts to try to tell you about who you were and what you did, you go ahead and tell him what God did in your life. You go ahead and share with him the testimony that God brought forth in your life, that you are a new creature, that you are alive, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God has quickened your body, and that you don't have to listen to that anymore. There is an amazing scripture that I'll read to you in Zechariah. Zechariah. Man, Zechariah. This is a good one. Zechariah chapter three, verses one through five. I'm gonna read it in the Amplified. It says, then the guiding angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, representing disobedient, sinful Israel. Wouldn't you like that job to be the representation of a horrible people of God? Just kidding. Uh, But Joshua, let me give you some context. Joshua was a high priest during this time. And uh, Zechariah is seeing a vision 
of Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan. So you got this whole thing that we're talking about. Joshua is sitting there. God is there in the form of the angel of the Lord and Satan is there. And the Bible says that Satan is standing at Joshua's right hand to be his adversary and accuse him. Joshua, this mortal man, God on one side, Satan on the other. And what's Satan trying to do? Slander Joshua, tell him, accuse him of sin and wrongdoing and this and that and whatever. And what does God do? This is amazing to me. This is what God does. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Even the Lord who now and ever has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not uh, a long snatched and rescued from the fire? What he was saying to Satan is, I have already saved and redeemed this man. You are rebuked. Don't talk anymore. And that's what God does in our life. When the enemy tries to accuse, we have the defense attorney, the judge at our other side, rebuking the enemy on our behalf because the Bible says that he is an intercessor, that he goes the places that we cannot go. And he will rebuke the enemy and say, stop talking, be quiet, don't accuse this saint. I have already saved him, I've already redeemed them. And as this is happening, Satan has to leave. And what we see here is a picture of how God transforms us. Now Joshua is standing there. Satan is gone. The Lord has rebuked him and told him to leave. And Joshua is standing there. And the Bible says that Joshua was clothed with filthy. If you translate that, it means nauseatingly vile garments and was standing before the angel of the Lord. So... God had already told Satan that this one has been long snatched from the fire, that, he, that he's been saved and redeemed and whatever for a long time. And Joshua is standing there in the flesh, that filthy garment, the, the record, if you will, of sin, that vile, nauseatingly vile garments, as Scripture says. And he was standing before the angel of the Lord. God didn't leave him there like that. God didn't look at him and be like, man, can't do anything with that. That's gross. That wasn't, that wasn't God's response. What God did for Joshua in this vision, that when he was clothed that way, he spoke to those who stood before him. This is God speaking. Remove the filthy garments from him. He don't need to stay like that. I've snatched him from the fire. Now change his clothes. Remove the filthy garments from him. And he said to Joshua, see I have caused your wickedness to be taken away from you and I will clothe you and beautify you with rich robes of forgiveness. Ooh, don't that just hit you in the soul? Because that's exactly what God does. That when he snatches us from the fire, when he saves us, he doesn't just leave us in the condition that he found us in. He told Joshua to change his clothes. Get rid of all those garments, the things that that label you as a sinner. Get rid of the things that label you as a child of wickedness or a child of this world or a child of the flesh. Get rid of those garments and allow me to clothe you. I will remove the wickedness from you is what God said. See, I have removed your wickedness to be taken away from you and I will clothe you and beautify you with rich robes. Because that sin, all, all the stuff that humans like to live in, that our flesh likes to wallow in, that stuff is vile to our holy God. If you're not here at 10 a.m., like going through our spirit life class, uh, I would encourage you to come because we've been talking about holiness for a long time and we're gonna keep going. But see, sin is so vile to a holy God. Sin is so ugly, honestly, to a holy God. God cannot... Uh, dwell with sin. It can't be a part of him. The Bible clearly states that. So what does he do? He doesn't just leave us in that sinful muck and mud. He changes us. He actually clothes us, the Bible says, that he will beautify us and clothe us in his robes, in robes of forgiveness and righteousness. And I, Zechariah, said, let them put a clean turban on his head so that uh, so they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with rich garments and the angel of the Lord stood by. I, I absolutely love this vision because what we see is 
the enemy, the accuser, trying to bring accusations to, uh, if you equate it to our life, to a saint. Someone who God has redeemed and saved already. And the enemy still is trying to point out all of the flaws and point out the sin that used to be there and try to tell God this person's not worthy. They, they've messed up too much. And yet we see our God as our defense attorney rebuking the prosecutor and telling him, no, those accusations, they may have been true a while ago, but all I see is the blood now. There's no more record. That record of sin has been expunged forever. So leave right? Leave. The enemy does not have any room to be there. And then the transforming power of God, that transforming power wipes away the destruction, the corruption that sin brings and puts God's robes on us. God doesn't just remove the record of sin, but he transforms us into his reflection. He transforms us and restores the image of God. He transforms us to be more like him. He re removes the labels, the filthy garments, and puts clean garments on us, and they're his garments. We don't have any clean garments to clothe ourselves in, so God has to do it. And Paul references this principle in the New Testament when he talks about how we have to take off the corruptible man and put on the incorruptible that there's an exchange that happens when we begin to serve God, that we cannot stay the way that we were when we came to God, that there is challenge that happens. There's conviction that comes. And God, if we allow him to, he performs surgery on us, spiritual surgery, and he changes our heart. And as Ezekiel prophesied, he takes out the heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh that he totally changes us from the inside out if we allow him to. God rebukes the accuser and casts him down, forgives our sin, and transforms us. That's the picture that we have. We have a prosecuting attorney trying to bring charges against the saints, but we have a God who's not just a judge, but he's our defense attorney. And he stands up and he intercedes on our behalf. He answers the accuser when we don't have an answer to give. And he says, I've already covered them in the blood. Let's all stand real quick. I'm going to bring this to a close real fast. Revelation chapter 20 is the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15 in the Amplified. He says this, And I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. For this, heaven and earth are passing away. This is in the Amplified. I don't know if I said that. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as written in the books. That is everything done while on earth. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades, that's the realm of the dead, surrendered the dead who were in them, and they were judged and sentenced, every one according to their deeds. Then death and Hades, that's the realm of the dead, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire, the eternal separation from God. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was hurled into the lake of fire. That doesn't sound like something. That does not sound like a fate I want to tempt. But this is what I'll tell you, is that as saints of God, as the children of God, we, this day is not one to be feared. This day appearing before God in all his majesty and glory and justice is not a day to be feared. Because I believe this, that when we get to the end of our life and we're standing before God, whenever that judgment happens and we're standing before God, like the Bible says, the books will be open. He's going to look at the record of everyone's life. And as a saint of God, and when I say saint, I mean one who is a child of God, meaning Acts 2.38 has been followed, repented, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and be filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. A saint of God has nothing to fear. Because even though while we're on, on this side of eternity, we have an accuser and a prosecutor, 
that's constantly going after our mind, trying to get us to believe that we are who we used to be. When we get to this point, to the verdict, to the end of our life, the judgment, the books of God will be open, but this is what he's going to see. For the saints, this is what he's going to see. So I want to encourage you that when the enemy comes against you, you remind him of the blood. When the enemy comes against you, you remind him of the testimony of how God changed your life. That's what it means when it said they overcame him. They overcame the enemy, the accuser, the slanderer by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So I just want to give you that encouragement that as the enemy attacks your mind, you remind him of what's in the book. And I want to encourage you at the end of life, you don't have anything to worry about if you've been washed by the blood. And I also want to encourage those who haven't been washed by the blood yet. Allow this blood to wash over you. Allow God to wash you clean in the name of Jesus in baptism. Allow God to fill you with his spirit, evidenced by speaking in tongues. We see that all through the book of Acts because the accuser is accusing the brothers and sisters, accusing the brethren. That's what Revelation says. And we have an answer to that, not our answer, but our creator's answer. Can we all just come down to the front today? And I wonder if those who have been washed in the blood, sanctified by the Spirit, as Scripture says, if you could just put some thankfulness on your lips today. Thank you, Jesus, for washing me clean. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. Thank you for covering me, covering my sins, providing an answer to the accuser when I don't have one. Thank you for defending my soul, Jesus. Thank you for being an intercessor on my behalf. When there's nothing that I can do, you step in and you're the answer to the situation. Lord, thank you for the revelation where you've said that you're the great I am. You are the answer to every situation. You become whatever we need to be and you have become our salvation. That's what your name means, the name of Jesus, that Jehovah has become our salvation. Lord, thank you. And I pray that if anyone here is coming under the attack of the enemy, that you would push back and rebuke the enemy. As that vision in Zechariah shows that when the enemy tries to bring those accusations, that you rebuke the enemy and cast him away so that you can say, I've already saved, I've already cleansed, and now I'm gonna put robes of righteousness on this believer. In the name of Jesus, eternity is real. Eternity is real and Jesus paid the price so we can be with him forever. Aren't you thankful for that? In Jesus' name. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Sons and daughters, walk 
with blood and washed with water. Sing the praises of the Father. Our God will finish what he started. Our God will finish what he started. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters. Bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. 